Dames et Heren, Mesdames et Messieurs, chers collègues, chers amis, welkom vanavond in het Paleis voor Schone Kunsten voor dit openingsevenement van Across, Eight Offices, Eight Objects, Eight Projects. Nous sommes particulièrement heureux de vous voir aussi nombreux pour cet événement ce soir, mais également puisque c'est un, un événement qui nous tient à cœur, un, un événement qui nous tient à cœur pour plusieurs raisons. Tout d'abord, c'est un événement qu'on qu organise avec une série de partenaires, avec euh, A+, Architecture in Belgium, la meilleure revue d'architecture euh, en Belgique, avec qui on a un, 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 une programmation très riche ensemble ici au Palais des Beaux-Arts. Ensuite, euh, également le Vlaams Architecture Institute, Flemish Architecture Institute, avec qui on a euh, déjà fait une fois un, un projet en 2009, Architecture in the Picture, une exposition à l'occasion du euh, euh, Architectural Yearbook, c'était à l'époque encore, avant des, des Architecture Reviews, euh, comme il s'appelle maintenant. Euh, et euh, c'était une petite exposition euh, de photographie à partir de la commande qu'ils avaient réalisée ou donnée aux photographes pour ce, ce yearbook. Et on est particulièrement heureux qu'avec cette deuxième collaboration, on continue une collaboration avec le VAI. Et tout à l'heure, Sophie Tecaini, la nouvelle directrice du VAI, va prendre la parole. Mais je suis heureux qu'on puisse continuer et j'espère que ce ne sera pas une deuxième et dernière collaboration, mais que ça donnera une, une suite dans le futur. On pourra peut-être en parler après. Puis, est, on est particulièrement heureux d'accueillir cet événement et cette exposition ici parce que c'est en quelque sorte une suite ou un, un, un événement qui célèbre la jeune architecture belge euh, après tant d'autres initiatives qui ont été prises par euh, entre autres le VAI avec la fameuse série 35 mètres cubes euh, c'était le VAI Vic de Single euh, avec Moritz Kuhn qui a travaillé là à l'époque euh, puis euh, nous-mêmes nous au Palais des Beaux-Arts toujours en collaboration avec A+, euh, Architecture in Belgium, on a fait euh, une série niche et Across est une, euh, une autre formule qui euh, explore euh, le, le, le jeune talent de, de part et d'autre euh, de la frontière linguistique. Du soit un sehr glücklich mit dem Evenement et mit der Tentonstellung, die jullie straks samen mit uns können entdecken. Ich gebe nun mit dem Wort an Lisa de Visser, hoofdredacteur en artistiek directeur van A+, uh, die dan vervolgens het woord zal geven aan Sophie de Cagny en zo verder. Dank u wel, Johan. Goedenavond, dames en heren. Ik uh, wil jullie graag hartelijk welkom heten op de opening van uh, deze Acros tentoonstelling. Vanavond hebben we acht architecten te gast. Atelier Veldt van Bellen, Gru, Laura Muldermans, Bernard Dubois, Madame Architectuur, LR Architect, Raamwerk et Centrale. Acht jonge architectenbureaus, acht projecten, één tentoonstelling. Een tentoonstelling die ook het kruispunt vormt, niet alleen van verschillende generaties en uh, verschillende achtergronden, maar ook van vier culturele spelers die de handen in elkaar slaan om samen te werken rond één project. Eén gezamenlijk project samen met dus A Plus Architecture in Belgium, het Vlaams Architectuurinstituut, de architectuurfaculteit van de Uliège en Beaux-Arts. Vier partners die samen dezelfde uh, missie delen binnen hun eigen regionale, nationale en internationale ambities, namelijk het verrijken en het verdiepen van een architectuurdebat. La collaboration entre A+, le Vlaams Architecture Institute et l'Uliège existe déjà depuis 2015. 2015 qui, date, euh, qui, qui marque la date du début du cycle de conférences à Cross euh, et qui est née en fait euh, d'un constat, d'une euh, méconnaissance et un manque de partage et de dialogue entre les cultures francophones et néerlandophones euh, de l'architecture en Belgique. 
Et donc c'est pour cette raison que a plus a souhaité offrir un, un podium à une jeune euh, scène architecturale euh, pour réfléchir euh, et euh, formuler publiquement sa démarche et le contexte dans lequel il exerce. Donc quatre bureaux, donc chaque année, quatre bureaux néerlandophones et quatre bureaux francophones ont été euh, invités à présenter leur travail respectivement à Liège, à l'université et au De Sengel euh, à Anvers. Et donc euh, les bureaux invités pour le cycle euh, étaient, par l'invitation pour donner une conférence, euh, mis devant le défi, le défi de l'introspection. Donc qu'est-ce que ça veut dire euh, d'avoir un bureau Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire de, de développer un discours Et surtout, comment le communiquer à l'extérieur Et donc en fait, c'était un vrai défi d'introspection. Euh, et un, un, pour beaucoup de bureaux, c'était la première fois qu'ils donnaient une conférence. Et donc, euh, c'était le défi de pouvoir formuler ce discours de manière de, euh, de, le, de le faire comprendre leur démarche et leur méthode de travail à un public connu, euh, non connu, donc un nouveau public. Tijdens de lezingreeks werd dit jaar elk bureau ingeleid door een gevestigd lokaal architect. Uh, en die over de taal aan de generatiegrenzen heen een uh, kritische outsidersblik bood uh, op het, uh, het uh, jonge bureau. Een, um, een blik die ook uh, een, een, een zekere diepgang gaf of een andere kijk gaf aan het werk van het bureau. En dus uit deze laatste lezingenreeks is deze tentoonstelling die we vanavond gaan kunnen bezoeken ontstaan. Voor de realisatie van de tentoonstelling wil ik graag een aantal partners bedanken. Dus naast de partners waar ik het daarnet al over had, had gehad, hè, dus Bozaar, Vlaams Architectuur Instituut en de Universiteit van Luik, wil ik ook graag de Cellule Architectuur van de Federation Wallonie-Bruxelles bedanken, de Vlaamse overheid, het Brussels of Stedelijk Gewest en ook onze sponsor Velux. Voor ik het uh, woord geef straks aan alle acht architecten die elk een uh, korte lezing zullen geven over het project dat ook in de tentoonstelling wordt voorgesteld, wil ik graag Sophie de Kenny uitnodigen hier op het podium, architectuur, uh, het Vlaams Architectuur Instituut, dus directeur van het Vlaams Architectuur Instituut. Dank je wel. Bonsoir tout le monde. De la part du VAI, je suis ravie de vous voir tous ici. Pour le VAI, le projet ACROS est très important parce qu'on est convaincu qu'une culture architecturale florissante ne peut exister qu'en stimulant le travail des jeunes architectes. Je voudrais remercier d'abord Lisa de Visser et Roxane Legrel de A+, pour l'initiative de la production de l'expo et pour la collaboration excellente. L'Université de Liège pour le partenariat dans la série des conférences et Beaux-Arts pour l'exposition. Ook heel veel dank aan alle jonge architectenbureaus die meededen aan dit project. We waren steeds heel blij verrast met uh, jullie insteken tijdens de lezingen en jullie presentatie hier vanavond is uh, even rijk aan ontwerphoudingen. We vinden dit project zo belangrijk dat we met het Vlaams Architectuurinstituut ook ons best willen doen om de tentoonstelling te laten reizen naar het buitenland, omdat we ervan overtuigd zijn dat het talent dat hier uh, aan het groeien is ook echt uh, het waardig is om uh, met een, een buitenlandse dialoog aan te gaan. En volgende week ga ik naar Noord-Rijn-Westfalen om daar uh, gesprekken over op te zetten. We houden jullie daar sowieso over op de hoogte en ik hoop dus binnenkort goed nieuws daarover te kunnen brengen. Ik denk dat het nu uh, de beurt is aan de architecten om één voor één in een uh, pecha kucha hun werk aan jullie voor te stellen. Uh, good evening. Um, we are uh, Marit and Door from Madame Architecture, uh, an office based here in uh, Brussels. Um, I will start with a short introduction of how we work and then uh, Marit will uh, tell you more about the project that we show um, in the uh, exposition today. Um, so uh, we don't uh, design starting from a predefined theory but we always uh, start with analyzing the context and the program that is always different for each project. So we work in a very pragmatic uh, way. Um, each time we are looking uh, for something strong to hold on to, um, that can be a grid or a rhythm or... Um, uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> or. Um, a rational structure that has the right scale and also the right uh, proportions. Um, the, the spaces that follow out of these structure, structures are then uh, filled in in a more intuitive way. 
Um, and there we have a lot of attention for um, experience and uh, how the light falls in, uh, the materials and the proportions and so on. Um, we work uh, a lot uh, with scale models because we think that is a very fair way of working because um, models never lie and um, they also allow you to focus on the things that are important for the concept or, or for the project. Um, we make spaces that have a very specific identity uh, but not always a very specific function um, and this gives a certain freedom to the users that is very important to us because we want to make um, places to, to live in with room for the inhabitants and also for all the daily life uh, objects. Um, we experiment a lot with different materials, um, mostly natural materials, um, and we like um, to use them or the colors or the textures to reinforce uh, the ideas that we have and to reinforce um, the identity of the buildings uh, within their, their context. Um, we always uh, think through the relationships between different spaces or how they can be framed uh, to one another. Um, and this uh, brings us to the project that is in the exposition today, um, where you see that interesting see-throughs uh, exist out of that. Um, Marit will tell you more about this project. The project IRIS is a renovation of uh, two row houses in the city center of Halle. Um, here you can see some pictures of the courtyards. Um, it's surrounded by huge apartment blocks. Um, so there's no direct sunlight and uh, not a lot of privacy. This is the model we made for uh, our first proposal. Um, we made an extension with a small um, floor print, but uh, um, a long facade, so which allows it's a lot of light entering in the extension and also in the existing building. And um, there's a view from inside to um, a blind wall uh, without views from the surrounding uh, and from the apartments. Um, the plan uh, shows us the blue area is the 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 house where they live and the the house next door that's the place where we um, provided the offices um, on the right you see an orange spot and that's also a, a garage um, that the owners own and with the extension we made the connection between all these three uh, spaces um, the Extension and the garden, they work together like almost a perfect rectangle. Um, this gives structure to the project and due to the rotation it makes um, with the houses, um, the extension really enters into the existing, uh, existing uh, building. Um, Part of the extension is the kitchen. It's really the center of the project, uh, which is important because the kitchen is most of the time the most active place um, of, a, of a house. Here you can see the results of the project. Um, this is a view from the back to the, the two row houses. Um, for the, the facade can be fully opened and which is important because you, feel it, you really feel the, the rectangle of the interior and the exterior that works together. Um, for the materials of the facade, we chose um, really um, um, not, uh, how do I say, um, they, they don't ask attention because um, to, uh, to reinforce the, the rectangle again. Um, this is a view from the other side, uh, from the row houses to the back. There's a connection uh, to the garage, this door. And there are some stairs in between, in between the kitchen and the, the connection to the garage. And the floor height of the space in between um, is a perfect height for a bench to the garden. Uh, 
Um, we made a, a lot of models for these projects. Uh, first, to test the proportions, the, the spaces, and the materials. And afterwards, we, this was our last model. Um, it's a detail of the kitchen island. Um, as you can see in the expo later. Um, the form of the kitchen and the kitchen island um, allows uh, um, that that is becoming a, a gathering place for the family and friends, and which is uh, perfect because the lifestyle of the owners is also like inviting families, friends, um, so a lot of people can can stand around and enjoy the place. For the office uh, in next door, uh, we made three uh, flexible platforms um, with an undefined function. It's uh, all polyvalent. Um, there's a big void um, on, the, on the left for uh, entering a lot of daylight. And in this void, the, um, the staircase, there is a staircase. Um, we choose uh, to show really the rough materials of the existing building. Um, and it's a perfect contrast with the uh, fine steel white staircase um, we designed. This is the last uh, picture. Um, this is the realization of the kitchen island um, that you can see in the exposition later. Um, Hope you enjoyed our, <laughs> our talk and enjoy the evening. Thanks for coming. Well, hello, good evening. Um, first of all, thanks so much for this uh, invitation. Um, I will talk briefly about one project, which is the project uh, that is uh, exhibited downstairs. Um, it's a project for a store, uh, so um, it's a program that is a bit uh, less usually presented in a context uh, like this one, and a program that is, um, which I'm getting very used to uh, in lots of projects, but uh, that I wasn't at all trained to, uh, to do, and which I find actually which I found very surprising the first time I had to do it, and which I found more and more interesting, actually, the more, uh, the more I do it. Um, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ah, voilà. Okay, so this was a store for uh, Zadig et Voltaire in Paris, uh, Rue Cambon. So I would like, first of all, to talk a bit about uh, the program and the way uh, it happens in the commercial, uh, commercial projects. Uh, first of all, the client arrives and he already has an image, a brand uh, to which I could relate or not relate to, but that's not exactly the point because the client has this image and he wants to do something with it and to translate it into architecture uh, somehow. Uh, when he comes, he wants to change his image or to change the image related to uh, the way he uses architecture but doesn't know how somehow. So the goal is to propose something that would relate to his identity but also uh, as importantly, was rema uh, will relate to mine and to the project we want to do uh, uh, as architects. So there's always a kind of interpretation and translation, let's say, of the brief of the client into a project. And that's, that's, that's always the, the kind of difficult moment that where we present uh, the first schematic design to the client. Will he accept it uh, or not? So in this case, Zadig et Voltaire had this image that they want to be a, a bit raw and very Parisian um, at the same time and, and, and this kind of uh, ambiguity which gives the, 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 the results uh, that, that, that it gives. And I was 
I thought a bit of how to use that in architecture and how to translate that into the teams that I'm interested in. And since I'm always a recurrent team in my, in my, in my practice that I'm interested in is the, um, the, uh, the remise en question, the questioning of the, <laughs> the questioning of the codes of the big movements uh, of the 20th century. And um, I thought that this was a interesting moment actually an interesting project to put that in experience and uh, to work on a very Parisian floor plan and Parisian and classical let's say um, architecture uh, with completely modernist vocabulary so that was really the, the goal of this project and they were presented it to the client and the client accepted to do it and that's how we get to 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 do this project reference. So basically that's the, the project is on three floors, so it's around 800 square meters, 700, um, on the Rue de Rivoli. So Rue de Rivoli is here that we all know in front of the Tuileries, so it's very recognizable Paris context. Um, it had all these walls uh, with doors that were actually not actualized and, and uh, actually not in an axis anyway and uh, and you could not ver uh, read really well the, the, the Parisian floor plan um, so when we start this kind of works it's actually the space is completely empty they have a lot of money to spend on an interior because the total budget is is 2.2 million euro just for the interiors um, but there's a lot of technical issues like uh, air conditioning and, uh, and, and, and stuff like that to deal with in, uh, in details. Anyway, so the project was about finding a Parisian identity uh, there and then treating it with this modernist vocabulary. So that's how it ended up finally. So all the rooms are in an axis. They're all like in a, on enfilade. We have this classical way of using the corniche and the decoration uh, on the wall. Um, here we worked with the concrete and chapeau de grès. So chapeau de grès is this Italian stone that looks a bit like concrete, but it's natural and very classical, uh, class classically used uh, in Milan. Uh, that is used in a very classical way of this it's encadrement de, de, de béton. Yes. Voilà. Um, so basically, that's we we have designed like all the pieces have been designed uh, for the for the project, the furniture uh, and everything. This kind of concrete has been poured on site. So it's kind of unusual for a commercial project because they usually like it to be extremely clean and extremely well finished. So it always looks kind of fake somehow. And we kind of did the contrary. So we poured it on site and we had to, to, to explain the French companies who always say no at the beginning uh, that uh, each piece of wall was a multiple of five centimeter and that all the walls needed to be calculated in order to be finished uh, as a multiple for five centimeters, which is uh, something obvious to all of us, but uh, wasn't in this kind of, uh, in this kind of context. Um, so at the end, the concrete cracks actually uh, a bit, but it's a way to, to prove it's, uh, it's natural uh, somehow. The interesting thing, I think, with commercial project is that somehow it, um, it, uh, it doesn't have the same responsibility, let's say social responsibility, than other projects because uh, this project is not imposed to anyone except, of course, for the people who work there and who actually don't have a say in, uh, in the design of the project because usually the owner of the brand orders the project and, and, and interacts with the architect and then someone else has to deal with the actual use of the project. But except for the people working there, um, the short term of, 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 uh, of the, the commercial project, maybe it's there for five years, maybe for 10, maybe for two, uh, who knows, 
and the fact that no one has to, to, to endure it day by day gives a lot of freedom, actually, to experiment and to do uh, spaces that are not only welcoming somehow or that push the, the functionality to its limit, also because the functionality is, is pretty simple. Uh, so here you see the, the, the axis of the project. Yeah, so of course uh, everything has been uh, produced for the projects, for, for each project we try to, to produce everything and to design everything. Voilà, thank you very much. <coughs> Two images on space in between. They deal with a different scale but both have a strong impact on how people experience the space, on how they behave, on how they use the space. The garden wall and the house by Hudson, the classical facade and the urban fabric in Vicenza. We understand space in between as undefined space, space without any specific program, a space that can be claimed space without any sorry space without any specific program a space that can be claimed and for that reason the space is potentially generous these three models are uh, an exercise in which we wanted to materialize the the space in between within our own projects the space in between is mostly inbuilt the first project is the reconversion of a row house. Um, the space in between is directly translated in the, the disconnection of different living rooms, which ended, up, which ended up for one of the rooms in a pavilion-like structure, down touching the existing walls. Within this disconnection, uh, there is developing an inflinade of uh, different rooms, resulting in a certain complexity, maybe a banal complexity. A complexity that is trying to form the framework for the social interactions of a contemporary family. The kitchen forms the center of the house and from here out there is an indirect connection to an, an intimate living space in the front, a pavilion in the back and an office space on the first floor. Within this scheme all family members easily can find a place for their own without necessarily closing off. Looking back, the indirect relationship is very clear, but what we're interested in is the space in between. This space exists both, interior and exterior, with more or less the same proportions. Crucial is that they have no clear function, and for that reason we think they are extremely functional. Of course, there is the disconnection of the the common wall and the new facade, and it's there for the light, but the main reason is the mental connection between the heart of the house and the garden. We didn't make a patio. We built a new structure in a very direct and primitive way, a stone plinth, wooden columns and beams, a metal cladding. The rhythm of the facade is directly resulting from the size of the panels, which gives the facade an almost classical maybe a human proportion. For the workshop in Maria Kerke, we try to reverse the classical ornament into a structural concept. Where the Greek architecture translated wooden details in stone ornaments, we wanted to translate these stone ornaments again into some simple building details, referring to the human scale. Two volumes, a house and a workshop, are shifted on the plot in between, there is an outer space formed by these buildings and two freestanding walls. Both volumes have different proportions according to program, context, orientation, but they speak the same formal language. The specific position of the different elements is resulting in a microclimate and a set of atmospheres strongly related to the surrounding and the functional program of the house and the workshop. It's the space in between. But in this case, the space in between has a program. There's a sculpture garden, uh, an outdoor workshop, a stock for stones. 
And again, there is the primitive stacking of stone and wood. Oversized beams are making the ornament in the facade. Light is entering through these beams in a very soft and indirect way. But now, there is no clear function for each room. Daylight and proportions are mainly defining how they're used. By shifting a structural core from the center, we created four rooms with a different scale, different light, and a specific relation to its context. There is no circulation, not in the workshop, not in the house. The user has to deal with the space. But because the rooms are not determined, the architecture can be claimed. The drawing room in the house is built following the same principles, but is more specific, more tactile maybe. A soft floor allows the artist to draw on the ground. Northern light is reflecting on the smooth plaster walls. And there is a focused view towards a nature reserve nearby. For the youth center in Lichtervelde, we divided the very typical program, a multi-purpose hall, into smaller rooms. Each room is simple, rectangular, but has its own height and proportion. Those rooms are connected and shifted around two courtyards. The architecture is the inbuilt space. The first courtyard towards the street is clearly public, but there is a wall. It works as a screen, as a decor inside the public domain, similar to what we did in Maria Kerke. The second courtyard is more intimate and works as a garden for both the youth center and the illegal cottages beside the plot. We wanted the building to work as an overscaled house, as an ensemble of connected rooms, rooms with clear functions, more or less like a kitchen is related to a dining room, the bar is connected to the main hall and so forth. Again, we are looking for a banal complexity within the architecture. Interior windows, voids, daylight, materiality are defining this complexity. But in fact, we wanted to do as less as possible. We wanted to make a building that is evident in its complexity, and for that, easily can be claimed by its users. Maybe we want to make a building without authorship. Some first pictures of the, the building in use. The wall works as a mindset. Now the height, the disconnection, the curve, the material are becoming important. Anyone can enter the building. The wall is open and inviting, but it's very clear that when you do, the space belongs to the youth. There is a gradient in the public space. The building is already claimed. At night, the building is transforming again. Maybe the courtyard is becoming a quite smoking area. Maybe it's a beer garden, maybe something else. Anyway, the building should be capable to hold some secrets. Thank you very much. OK. So uh, good evening. Thanks for, for the invitation to take part in this exhibition. Uh, so, so let's go for, for seven minutes, uh, I will try. Uh, first, uh, I'm, uh, I'm alone here, but, but we are a team. Uh, it's not a, a recent picture, but, but we like it. Uh, and this team is, is working every day with three main centers of reflection. The first is the understanding, the understanding of expectation to meet. The second is the design with intensive exchange in the team. Uh, to, to exceed these expectations, and then the implementation by, by seeking to define a, a fair balance between all components of, of the project. Most of us are living close to nature, and it's important because uh, countryside are historically a place uh, with architecture without architects. And, and then the, the buildings are simple, logical, economical, it implies nearly only understanding of everyday uses. And for, for all of us, uh, drawings are, are means of ordering, of decision making. But, but for us, uh, models are also really important because it's, it's important to test options and, and to, to share quickly the project between us. And it's also a way to, to approach the, the truth of the, of the proposal. 
Tonight, uh, one housing social project, it's the, the arsenal, uh, an existing building, historically a, a place to, to repair trains, and on the edge of an old industrial site to, to develop, in contact with the, the housing area of Pontacel. Pontacel, it's a, a small city near Charleroi. And the question, uh, how to put uh, 24 apartments in, in this empty shell. Uh, the size was 20 by 40 meters. The facade uh, had been renovated and, and we could not touch them. And then we, we started with three questions. The, the first one, it's the, the dialogue to, to keep between the existing walls and the, and the new ones. Uh, the second, it's, it's the light uh, in relation with the the orientation and also with the width of the building and, and then the, the transition also uh, between uh, public and private spaces. And very quickly we, we decided to, to divide the building in two sides uh, with an, an inner street and, and we work with two main references, the, the narrow middle-aged street and also a, a Portuguese project from uh, Iris Mateus. Here you, you can see the, the beginning of the street uh, in contact with public space, it indicates the, the main entrance and, and it's for us the, the first transition in direction to private spaces. The plan, uh, the main entrance on the left, uh, a lateral one for, for future connection with the site to, to develop and the, the main street and also the small lateral alleys. Uh, two sides for housing. On the, the east side you have a deeper and designed on three floors. Uh, in relation uh, to, the, to the light there are crossing apartments. It's uh, up and down, it's the, the west side and it's tighter and also uh, designed on four floors with uh, technical spaces and cellars and three apartment floors. The sections, uh, the sections drive us to, to define the, the death of housing in relation to the need of natural light and it was also the, the opportunity to, to play with the layering of public and private stairs. The existing east elevation with the existing windows that, that we have to keep. And the typology of, of housing, housing uh, on the east uh, with sleeping spaces on the first floor and bedrooms placed back, placed back from the facade to, to take distance with the existing windows and to, to bring light into the, the living rooms. And on the other side, uh, you can find bedrooms taking light from the inner street. The west housing typology is not so deep. Uh, there is only windows uh, on, the, on the, the west facade and, and there is a, a blind facade uh, to, the, to the inner street. And uh, just one picture that, that we like, it's a special bathroom uh, close enough to to benefit for, for generous natural light and far enough to, to ensure privacy. And then the, the model. The model was very important to, to define the, the neighborhoods generated between apartments located on both sides. It's a, a first version of the, the wooden object created for this exhibition that, that you will see uh, later uh, as a conceptual synthesis. And designing this, this project it was, was also uh, a kind of designing the two interior facades to, to define the, the common space and to preserve intimacy for housing. And we work on, on models to, to understand this complexity. And it was a credible approach to, to reality when, when you see the final pictures of this inner street, uh, a wide open facade with the, the random arrangement of the of the opening. The other inner elevation, almost blind, except for, for a few punctuals opening like a, like a wink. 
and uh, simplicity. The project wa was also the opportunity to, to learn about how to build with a, a small number of details. And it was the same for, for the materiality. Uh, there is only uh, raw concrete for, for the ground, for the stairs, and also for, for the foundation, for the, the technical spaces. And then uh, anodized aluminum color brass for, for windows and a, a smooth, warm cement uh, to play with the natural light on, on walls. From the start, we, we designed the street as a, a semi-public transition space and we, we integrate uh, steps, ramps. Uh, it's a, a covered outdoor meeting place where the, the existing building would still be understandable. And it's also an exchange space for adults. It's a place to play for children. And, and they are our client. And as everybody knows here, uh, Architecture needs clients, so uh, I wish you a pleasant evening and thank you very much. Good evening everybody and thank you for the invitation. Um, this is a project that has been uh, realized in cooperation with uh, Olivier Routels, uh, artist and architect, and uh, Dirk Jaspert, uh, structural engineer. Um, that is also the place where a little village in West Flanders uh, asked us to uh, propose a watchtower. It's located on a recreation uh, area on a walking path. Um, we had to go very high because we had to go over the trees in order to see on a beautiful day uh, the towers of Bruges. So that meant we had to go almost 35 meter highs and with a quite limited uh, budget. Um, at the same time, in the little village, there were also two other very uh, important elements, like the high tower of the church, from where the other picture has been taken, and also the pillars, radio pillars uh, from the World War, um, which were very uh, remarkable in this um, village. Um, so how are we going to place a, a third element uh, in this context? Um, also, the area was, uh, it's a very small village. Um, we refer to Walter de Mulder, uh, very cozy. Um, it also has one little bar uh, in front, and the only one, only bar in front of the church um, called uh, New York. Um, it's a little village which is also very proud of being in this area. Um, in that little bar, we, we quite um, quick were like, okay, let's, let's do something very rational, very um, uh, something prefect because we didn't have the budget, so we have to do it in a very clever way. Um, and we ended up very soon in a kind of prototype of, of Pilon um, as a third archetype next to the church and, and, the, and the radio Pilon. Um, but also because this structure uh, would give us more flexibility later on in working out um, how are we going to uh, walk up um, this uh, pylon. Um, it's also an, an object which is very recognizable and uh, which you could maybe think it has been standing there for always. So it's placed uh, a lot uh, with this double feeling um, of imposing something or being already there. Um, so we started sketching and searching for a way how we can uh, now add a kind of scenographical walk uh, and how can it going upstairs uh, being also an experience. Uh, and at the same time, searching to structures and, uh, and the opportunity to using it, we passed by the Tour Eiffel, which is also a little bit based on this way of, of constructing very high and, and, and rational. Um, and, and that brought us actually even to the, the Statue of Liberty. It is a kind of same structure. Um, and, and what does it has, yeah, again, two, two pillars next to each other, like, like in the village. What does it has to do with, with our tower? Uh, in one way, not so much, but at the same time, a lot, because the village also wanted a kind of watchtower with a story, with a meaning, with a second layer. 
And that little bar uh, used to be the place where they sell the tickets of the Red Star Alliance to go to New York. And that was for them also an important story. And by accident, we ended up like um, continuing that story. So we were even more uh, convinced of, let's just go for the pylon. Um, that's where it's located. Um, so you can see the radio masts, also, uh, pylons from the same area and, and the church and the little ball, that's the little bar. Um, that's another view. And on the ground, we have, uh, we started with four uh, concrete elements, which uh, are also an opportunity to sit, so the people who were not able to go up also have a kind of experience, because the pylon is more than just a, a structure to get up, but it's also like in the village, let's go there and let's go play, and let's, let's, let's that it's more than just uh, going up. Um, we have a double uh, spiral going up. That's also a reason why we wanted to be very rational with the pylon. So we have still like opportunities for the scenography how going up. Um, the structure in, in red in the middle is like under 45 degrees and that's hanging the staircase. So the staircase is actually not touching the ground because the structure is supporting everything. Um, and so you go up until you reach. Uh, it's a little bit also like the experience we had in the church tower. Very narrow, high railings to then finally we play with the height of the eye, like then you, you can't look over it or sometimes a little bit. And then you end up at 20 meters with the first platform to look out watching the, um, the church, was it then? And after we go further up in a more irrational way, um, more open way f for those who dare to go even more high, because I think it, it's quite high to do, to, to do it. Um, and these ones are actually at the exteriors because the pylon is also getting too narrow at a certain point. So we have a kind of double, um, uh, two experiences to go up. And at the end, you have a view to the other side, to Bruges and, uh, and over the forest. So there the railings are like much more transparent. Um, did I show? Oh yeah, and there there was that picture. It's from that platform. If you look up, that's the first time you, you have the, the view over the pylon. So there you can also see the, the difference between the first part and the second part, uh, where in the first part you really are like limited in looking around. Well, that's the last thing. Thank you very much. Bonjour, donc le projet qu'on présente, c'est un projet qui s'appelle le Jardin Oasis. C'est un projet qui se situe à Cahors, dans le sud de la France. C'est un, un micro-écosystème climatique qui est composé de trois éléments. Donc il y a une structure brumisante, il y a une strate végétale densément plantée et il y a... Euh, un sol poreux qui est un sol vivant qui travaille avec deux éléments euh, qui sont le, la terre et l'eau. Euh, dans son usage, c'est un lieu de rendez-vous pour euh, les gens qui se rendent au cinéma qui est à proximité. C'est un lieu qui va vivre euh, au fil des saisons. C'est un espace public, évidemment, je ne l'ai pas dit. Et, et qui, va, euh, qui va vivre aussi la nuit, puisqu'il y, y a des petites lumières de fêtes foraines qui sont accrochées sur, sur la structure et ça va on peut faire vibrer un peu cette structure. C'est une, une, une halte fraîche qui est implantée dans un, dans un projet un peu plus vaste d'espace public qui fait environ un hectare, qu'on réalise également, et, donc, et qui est très minéral. Et donc c'est vraiment un point, un point de, de fraîcheur dans, dans cette dans ce grande minéralité. Et donc le, on l'a appelé jardin oasis, et, et l'action de l'oasis, c'est vraiment au sens littéral. Donc c'est... C'est une polarité, c'est donc un lieu de fraîcheur, c'est un lieu ombragé, un lieu planté. Et puis c'est également un lieu où on va trouver un point d'eau, c'est un endroit où on va pouvoir venir se désaltérer. Donc dans ces, ces dimensions, euh, c'est assez petit, ça fait 250 mètres carrés, c'est environ un, le cercle il fait 18 mètres de diamètre. La structure elle fait environ 4 mètres de haut avec un pas de 1,80 mètre. Et puis on a une strate arborée qui est entre 6 et 8 mètres. Et euh, la strate basse, elle est en, aux entours de 
1,50 m mètres. Et au centre, donc, il y a cette pierre d'eau qui est une grosse pierre de 2,10 m par 75 cm de hauteur. Donc, cette pierre d'eau, c'est une fontaine. C'est une fontaine à boire. Donc, c'est simple, on vient boire en se... En, en se penchant sous la, cette barre en laiton et ensuite il euh, n'y a pas de siphon sur la pierre, c'est l'eau qui coule euh, tout simplement dans ces, dans ces vases qui sont très légèrement creusés et ensuite euh, ça s'écoule dans le, dans le gravier du jardin et ça vient arroser les, les plantations qui sont euh, au pied. Ce projet, et c'est aussi un projet euh, poupée russe en fait, il vient s'inscrire dans... dans dans un, dans un système d'emboîtement de, de forme, de lieu et de, à différentes échelles. Donc il y a cette pierre d'eau qui est incluse dans le jardin Oasis, qui est également euh, inscrite dans le, le parvis du, du cinéma. Et ensuite, ce, ce, ce parvis du cinéma, il est incru, un, un, inclus dans un, un domaine qui est composé de, de différents euh, bâtiments publics, qui est euh, également euh, inscrit en fait, dans tout un chapelet d'espace public qui, qui est connecté à, à une des voies majeures de, de la ville de Cahors. Et cette ville de Cahors, elle est, on, on a remarqué qu'elle était aussi incluse dans, le, dans cette boucle du lot, là, qu'on voit sur le dernier schéma. Et tout autour, en fait, il y a les, les, causes, euh, les causes calcaires, les montagnes calcaires autour de Cahors. Et donc, c est, c est, cette pierre calcaire, c'est vraiment la matière du lieu. Et c'est avec cette euh, pierre qu'on euh, qu va réaliser euh, notre grande pierre d'eau. On va aussi euh, réaliser euh, une partie du mobilier euh, de, du parvis du cinéma, euh, notamment les bancs dans cette pierre-là. Euh, et la, la pierre, c'est euh, aussi notre quotidien, parce que c'est une photo qui est prise en bas de notre atelier. Euh, c'est euh, le travail de, du sculpteur avec qui on partage les, les bureaux. Lui, il est au rez-de-chaussée, nous, on est à l'étage. Donc, euh, tous les jours, en fait, on voisine avec, euh, avec ces sculptures. Et donc, euh, euh, ça va être aussi euh, euh, le prétexte et l'occasion de, de travailler sur cette matière. Donc, quand je dis euh, le bureau, c'est que, voilà, nous, on, notre bureau, il s'appelle Gru. On est... Euh, on, est, on a un bureau ici à Bruxelles euh, et on a aussi un bureau à Paris et donc on, on migre, on passe la frontière en fait au, au fil des, des projets et des, euh, et des opportunités. Donc c'est voilà cette photo des grues en, migra en migration on exprime cela. Euh, donc là, on est de retour à, à Romainville, dans notre atelier euh, euh, parisien. Donc euh, nous, on est à l'étage, et donc euh, au rez-de-chaussée, il, il y a effectivement l'atelier du sculpteur Yann Barrère. Donc ça, c'est dans son, dans son atelier, donc la, la pierre d'eau là qu'on voit euh, sur la droite, qui est euh, en cours de, de travail. Donc ça a été vraiment euh, l'occasion de, de, de tester ce prototype, de tester la matière en fait euh, réelle dans laquelle on va aller fabriquer, euh, euh, fabriquer euh, ce, cette, euh, cet objet. Et donc c'est l'objet qui est présenté euh, dans le cadre de l'exposition. Euh, toujours sur la, les recherches en fait sur la matière du lieu, c'est un des petits, euh, euh, des, des petits échantillons de toutes les briques hein, sur lesquelles on a, on a travaillé. Donc tous ces pavés de terre cuite qui vont constituer en fait le sol minéral de la place euh, du, du parvis du cinéma dans lequel est inscrit en fait le, le jardin Oasis. Donc euh, ce sol, c'est un, donc ce grand sol minéral, c'est un grand tapis qui fait à peu près 3000 mètres carrés. Donc ça va être un un pavé de terre cuite euh, euh, gris-brun, comme ça, avec une pose à chevron, très simple. Et donc, on a cette inclusion ensuite de, de, de Jardin Oasis. Ce qui est assez euh, amusant, c'est que c'est aussi un, donc ce projet est en France et, et la, la, le pavé de terre cuite, il est belge, qu'on a choisi. Euh, ça, c'est encore euh, euh, sur la, la recherche, enfin, la recherche sur la matière, c'était aussi la recherche vraiment sur la matière végétale, donc euh, quel type de plantation on allait, on allait poser, et comment ça allait euh, jouer avec les arbres existants euh, qui se trouvent aujourd'hui sur le lieu, et également euh, comment ça, ça joue avec, euh, avec la structure. Donc on a fait plusieurs euh, tests en, en maquette de ça. Euh, donc le choix des, de la strate arborée, euh, ça a été important de trouver un, un arbre qui avait un, un joli port, qui, qui, euh, qui, avait, qui était intéressant à toutes les, toutes les saisons. Voilà, donc on a beaucoup euh, euh, testé, réfléchi, on est allé voir en pépinière euh, différents, différents arbres. On a choisi des mélias, ça, ce sont des, des mélanchiers. Et euh, sur la strate, euh, la strate basse, on a cherché donc, euh, des végétaux qui, qui, qui soient dans cette évocation de l'oasis, donc des, plutôt des, des végétaux un peu rares, un peu singuliers, avec des grandes feuilles, etc. Quelque chose qui, qui pouvait vraiment être une, évo une évocation de, 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 cette, de cette oasis et qui soit adaptée au, au climat de Cahors. 
Euh, donc ça, c'est la pierre qui est en cours de taille. C'est juste une fois qu'elle a été uniquement polie, en fait, on a vraiment, il y a vraiment quelque chose qui s'est passé. On s'est dit, ah oui, c'est vraiment une matière intéressante. On dirait, la, ça faisait comme une lune. Et donc ça a été, euh, ça a été aussi le, le travail avec le sculpteur, euh, l'aller-retour de, de dire, on va avoir quelque chose de très poli sur le dessus et de beaucoup plus brut sur, sur les, les faces euh, de côté et puis rehaussé par, par ce laiton qui donne un, un aspect un peu précieux. Et donc voilà, donc ça c'est les, les dernières finitions euh, qui, euh, donc de notre objet qu'on présente dans l'exposition, qui est entre les mains du, du sculpteur. Et donc ça a été pour nous, en fait, cet objet, on l'a réalisé euh, spécialement pour l'exposition. Ça a vraiment été une, une opportunité intéressante de croiser euh, plusieurs disciplines et puis d'avoir euh, l'occasion de, de travailler là-dessus. Donc on remercie l'invitation. De... Sorry, my son's birthday is today, so I had to go home and eat cake. But <laughs> Otherwise, I would have done it alone. So, hi, everybody. We are uh, Atelier Events van Belle. We are uh, the complete office. We graduated in 2004, and directly after we did some uh, experience at uh, some renovated offices, we started with our own office, because we had a big urge to do our own thing. Uh, I will tell you two stories to begin with, uh, things we learned during our little career. This is actually the first building, new building we have ever built, like 10 years ago, in a be very beautiful landscape, Flanders Ardennes, a very nice environment. We made the viewing box towards the environment, so it was an office space with very big windows, so you can have a very nice view on the surroundings. Day one, they used the office, they put it uh, actually very full with rotan chairs, so it was completely destroyed or a beautiful concept. The second story I want to tell you, we, uh, 10 years ago we have built a very small but nice barn and the constructor uh, had someone with him who loved drinking beer, so he drank a lot of beer, and there was a, we have put a jute in the, in the concrete. So here you can see, he made a little fold. He, he, he succeeded to, to not fix the jute, so we had a little spot here. So we, we, that lesson we learned, you have, during building process, you have lots of errors. So you have to deal with those errors. So you have to deal with clients who do their own things and you have to deal with errors. So we should suggested uh, a solution like this. For example, we, we said to the owner, just put a Banksy on it and everything will be okay. He didn't do it, he, he put a new uh, facade instead. So um, last year we had a very nice article in Mark magazine where Dominic Peters had l gave a little insight in how we work and she came up with a very nice title of storytelling and actually we're going to show you some projects in, in which we try to explain how we design and which stories we try to tell. Um, this is our office uh, at the moment. It's in the center of Ghent, and uh, we bought an old burnt-down costume shop. So it was a huge fire. 20,000 theater costumes that are all synthetic were burned down. So we actually found the site like this, and we found it really charming, actually. We were inspired by the ruin, um, but we were also... We wanted to make four apartments and an office, and we also tried to tell a story with our buildings, how can you live together, but also how can a paso be more than just an empty square? And so we were inspired by ruins, by Italian pasos, and by architecture that looks really spontaneous and not too designed. This is the courtyard of the Gewat office and the apartments. So you can see stairs going in all directions. You can see reversed stairs. You can see a lot of mirrors. We love mirrors in our work uh, because you can reflect the sunlight all the way. Actually, almost the whole of the courtyard is uh, covered, only a little square of uh, air that is really 
uh, vertical in the plan, but with this huge mirror, you just can see a whole different fantasy world. This is a recent project. Uh, it's a renovation of a house in Ghent where the, the client wanted to renovate the extension of the building, but we have uh, decided to just destroy it and uh, make a smaller building. But they wanted to, to have lots of contact with the garden, so the garden became lots, lots bigger. So we have put a very big uh, garage door in, uh, in the rear facade, so with one push on the button you can open the whole facade of your living room. So we got inspired by the idea of the garage, so we made an inverted garage of this project. So uh, we used materials that are used in garages. We, we made everything visible that could be visible, like all the tubes and canals we have in lots of buildings. So uh, and we also have made a covered terrace in the garden, which uh, reminds of a, a gas station. So we were inspired by this project in another way afterwards. So we were, we, it made us think of the Pirelli calendars, the famous Pirelli calendars. So we made a photo shoot with lots of nice ladies to make a new calendar and make the circle around. So we, we sent the calendar to all, all our clients and, uh, and constructors. Um. We try not to make our work too arty, or like we say, arty farty. Um, but um, we want to make a, sometimes we want to make a building that just reflects as not being there, or, or a building that's sort of invisible. And the first building that Martin showed you, the notary office, five years later, the notary asked us to build an extension on the building, um, which was very hard for us because it's your first building and you're kind of attached to it. So, um, like the work of Anish Kapoor, he can build structures that really disappear in the environment. So we build a box inside, it's completely in wood. The outside is completely covered with uh, inox, inoxidable. Um, so the photo on the right is one of our favorite photos because the building is there, but it's not really there. This is also a little story about the renovation in Ghent. Um, Delphine, she wanted a big garden, and Hans wanted to read his, uh, his paper in uh, the sun. So we came up with a solution that um, we made a new space in, uh, in the garden, which felt like an autumn sprawl, like you're going on an autumn sprawl, like we show here. So we, we translated the concept into a constructional concept, so the beams you see are actually supporting the roof, so everything could be made very thin. And also the floor, we covered it with, uh, with hexagonal tiles in the different shades of uh, autumn colors. Um, we're also really inspired by uh, comic books or by um, the more popular art, which is uh, Peters and Schuiten, they make uh, comic books with a really kind of futuristic Jules Verne um, steampunk drawings. So when we were asked to extend this little house, it's an, old, it's an old farm, but in the back there was already uh, actually very cool uh, 1970s or 90s extension. So we decided we're not going to try to hide all those different styles, we're just going to add something completely different. So we built this, uh, it's actually a bedroom and an entrance and a bathroom for the couple. And it looks like some people call it the copper whale or uh, a kind of um, submarine. So we end up with uh, the project which is shown here. Uh, we are also, we uh, huge Gordon Mata Clark fans. We like the way he attacks buildings. So uh, we had a, an... Um, a client who was a musician and artist and asked us to renovate his uh, house, but was actually in a very, very bad state. So uh, we had to do something uh, very um, drastic. So we, like Gordon Mata Clark did, we attacked the house, we made a big hole in it, we ordered a big tree, we put the tree in the hole and put a lot of concrete in the basement so the tree was fixed and afterwards we put new beams between the, the tree 
trunk and the old facade and removed everything which was inside. And then we put uh, the new floors on it, which, which go in a spiral way up, which gives a very, um, it's a very uh, theatrical house, but it works also very nice because light, the light of the old facade falls in in very dynamic way. So I have a, this is the picture shown here in the exposition. So this is a little insight in how we work. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. So good evening. Um, I'm Radim Lauda from Central. I came with Paul Moucher, Valentin Pire, and Pierre Burkel, uh, my three partners. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the whole organiz organization uh, to allow young offices to show their work at VIE uh, in Liège, but also here in Beaux-Arts, um, in this incredible uh, Roton de Bertouille. I will be a bit lazy because I will not speak a lot. I will just show a video, if it works.
Thank you very much. And now I would like to give the final, for the final time, the floor to uh, Roxanne de Grel. Roxanne de Grel is head of programmation of the exhibitions and the conferences for A+. And without her, this exhibition would not have been possible. Thank you. Uh, wat een plezier jullie met zoveel te zien. We hadden dat niet verwacht. Uh, dank jullie wel aan de acht bureaus voor jullie presentaties die ons een glimp geven in jullie werk. Uh, graag bedank ik jullie ook allemaal voor jullie betrokkenheid, jullie enthousiasme en jullie medewerking. Um, ik denk dat we met deze presentaties niet alleen een inkijk hebben gekregen in jullie werk, maar ook een zicht op de grote variëteit aan jonge architectuurpraktijken hier in België. L'exposition qui ouvre ses portes ce soir est le reflet de cette diversité, car, comme vous le savez, elle rassemble, on l'a dit plusieurs fois ce soir, euh, des, des bureaux qui ont donné des conférences à Anvers et à Liège pendant l'année 2018. Et d'ailleurs, quel plaisir c'est de vous voir tous réunis euh, ici ce soir à Beaux-Arts. Euh, pour marquer la fin de ce cycle de conférences, on leur a demandé à chacun d'entre eux d'exposer un projet significatif de leur pratique euh, à travers une image et un objet. Euh, C'est un fo format très cadré, mais qui les met tous sur un même pied d'égalité et qui permet ainsi de faire ressortir leur euh, spécificité. Euh, pour l'exposition et pour la mise en espace de celle-ci, bedank ik graag onze scénographen. Thomas, Jochen en Wien, die een heel coherent geheel hebben ontworpen. Dank jullie wel voor de toewijding en jullie flexibiliteit ook. Um, en er is niet alleen een tentoonstelling vanavond, er is ook een publicatie. Um, deze is een aanvulling aan de tentoonstelling en biedt een meer volledige uitleg. Dus neem ze zeker mee om alles te begrijpen. Ja, het roze boekje daar. Um, Daarin vind je verschillende teksten terug over de bureaus, maar ook over de tentoongestelde projecten. Uh, cette publication a été réalisée par Hubert Knakich, uh, le graphiste que je tiens également à remercier ce soir. Et avant de tous vous inviter à aller voir l'exposition qui a lieu dans la salle bleue, le Salon Europa en bas, uh, je tiens à remercier tout spécialement Lara uh, ce soir pour sa précieuse aide et sans qui on n'y serait certainement pas arrivé. Euh, merci Lara et bonne soirée à tous.